Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. I'm Nicole Bagley, and today we are talking with Kim Hartz from Kim Hartz Photography. She's an academy coach, an Elevate coach, an incredible businesswoman, and a master at breaking down lighting with pet photography, whether that's studio lighting or off-camera flash. And today we're talking about taking that flash outside with some off-camera flash, and we are getting started with off-camera flash with Kim Hartz. You're going to love it. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. If you're a pet photographer ready to make more money and start living a life by your design, you've come to the right place. And now, your host, pet photographer, travel addict, chocolate martini connoisseur, Nicole Begley. Hey, everybody. Nicole here from Hair of the Dog. And I am back with a wonderful guest, Kim Hartz from Kim Hartz Photography. She's also a coach in the Hair of the Dog Academy and our Elevate program. She's been on the podcast before, and you guys know her and love her. Welcome back to the podcast, Kim. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So yeah, we were um, chatting about having you back on and wanted to talk a little bit about something that a lot of people want to kind of dabble with and play with and learn more about. And that is off camera flash. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I I, uh, I love off camera flash. And a lot of people are very scared of it. And they shouldn't be. So right, uh, right. Yeah, so it's not that hard. It's just right. got to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it seems so overwhelming at first, because I think of just the large amounts of equipment out there. And mm -hmm. you're scared of picking the wrong thing. And then oh my gosh, how do I possibly get this to balance and this and that and use it? What's the correct way? Or what's the right way? I just and they get totally overwhelmed and shut down. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was learning, and you know, I was, it was really quite frankly, just like learning to shoot my camera on manual when at first you're like, oh my gosh, okay. So if I lower my shutter speed, I need to raise my ISO. Wait, how? And you're like trying to figure out how that whole exposure mm -hmm. triangle works and what affects what. And then all of a sudden one day after you've been practicing for a little bit, it just clicks and you're like, oh, why? Yeah, I, I why? got this now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why did I think that was hard? This is so easy. <gasps> right. And, off camera flash for me was the same exact way where it just like I was so in my head and thinking about it so much. And then you just practice a little bit. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, light bulb, literally the light goes off. <laughs> right? No, I mean, and that's a, a great way to put it. It is very similar. It's like learning anything new, you know, that you just have to practice. And, right. you know, do do your homework a little bit, figure out how it's supposed to work, and then really just continue to do it. Like same when I learned studio lighting. Yeah. I mean, I, I really had to learn how to use my lights and learn how I wanted the look, you know, how do I want the light to look? What did I have to do? Same with the manual camera. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Now it's like, oh, of course you just do this, blah, 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 you know? <laughs> that, right. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I know my camera has gotten to the point where people ask me, Hey, what button do you use for your back button focus? Or what button do you press for this or that? I'm like, uh, I don't know. Let me hold your camera. Cause I literally yeah. don't know what button I press. I just have you to hold the where camera. It is. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, yeah, that's, it's pretty funny how that works. So when I got a new camera, cause I have a Nikon and I have a Sony, I, it was like getting the Sony was relearning everything because oh, it's yeah. totally different, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's like, why did I do this? But at the same time, it's a good thing, but yeah, yeah. Right. there's right. a learning curve with everything. Yeah. What are you shooting with mostly now? Both. Uh, yeah. so it's, I don't know why I do this, but I still shoot my Nikon in my studio Okay. And I typically travel and do my off camera flash with my Sony because it's smaller. Right. Um, it's more compact. And I, I thought I was going to change over to that whole system, but I still love my Nikon. Yeah. But the Nikon I use in studio, it's a D4. It's huge. That's why I don't travel with it. But um, I need, I'm, I should probably get a new Nikon, honestly, because it's super old. And uh, I just, there's so many great options out there now that are smaller. So we'll see. I, but I won't go mirrorless with Nikon because I'm mirrorless with Sony. So right, but then I have two right. systems, two sets of lenses. Like I'm just not smart in that respect. When it, you know, <laughs> but we, you know, you just get comfortable with what you're comfortable with. So yeah, for sure. I know. I was so excited when uh when Canon came out with all their new the R fives, R sixes, oh, yeah. and all their new mirrors line. And I tried oh, to switch to I Canon years ago, and I just I couldn't. I didn't like the feel of the Canon in my hand. Yeah, so like the Nikon. It's just it's very personal, you know. Right, but right. I, I, you know, and the Canon has great products. I just couldn't. I just couldn't do it. 
I think I'd probably be the same way with Nikon because it's like just different enough that you'd be right. holding it and using it and you're like, this is not what I'm used to. No, so, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. Oh my goodness. Anyway, we're not talking about cameras I, I here. Know, but sidetracked, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to evolve. That's all good. This that's what happens on this podcast. Yeah. But anyway, we're talking about off camera lighting. So mm-hmm. maybe we can start off with why someone might want to use off camera sure. lighting. Well, uh God, there's so many reasons. So uh let me just start with I'll just list them all out. Um, well, first of all, it allows you flexibility to shoot any time of day. There's no, mm-hmm. I have to shoot at 8 a.m. or 6 p.m. or whatever the hours for, you know, golden. I don't even know, honestly, anymore because I don't worry about it. You can shoot any time of day in any type of lighting situation, which really adds a lot of flexibility to your scheduling. And also, if you learn how to do off-camera flash, it allows you to give your images a, a level of professionalism that you can't get with just natural light sometimes. Mm -hmm. You are able to add in more dimension, more depth and texture in the pet's fur. Um, You're able to add a direction of light if you're photographing on a really flat day, catch lights in the eyes. And there's just something about, you know, an off-camera flash image that I feel like has just something more to it versus just a natural light. You know, depending on the situation, obviously, natural light is gorgeous, but off-camera flash can allow you to create a look like that when the lighting conditions aren't ideal. Yeah. without it looking like you use flash. I mean, that's the goal really is to be able to balance the flash and the ambient or natural light available um, to make it look like you didn't use it. You know, mm-hmm. that's always my goal. I don't want it to look like I used the light, but I want there to be something on there that's like, oh, there's something about this image. It's just, you know, the dog really pops from the background and the, you can see all the texture and the fur. There's light in the eyes. And um, it just... If you can also use know how to use off-camera flash, you can walk into any light situation and be able to deal with it, you know, yes. any time of day. And I think that's a big, big thing. So it's, it's, it's about being able to problem solve once you know how to use off-camera flash. I, I typically, if, I, if I'm not in my studio, if I'm on location or in a client's home, I always bring a light. Mm-hmm. Because if, I mean, I always scout beforehand anyways, but you never know. And if there's a situation where, ooh, the light's not really great here, but if I put my light here, I can add light in and I can really make this work. So it really gives you a lot more capability to create really nice portraits without having to just worry about what's available and, um, you know, that being your only option for light. So, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's important that people approach it. I know that's how I approach it is, um, you know, I, if the natural light is beautiful, I will 100% totally, go with the yeah. natural light all day long. But sometimes you're in situations, maybe, you know, you're shooting, like I had a client session that they wanted to shoot and it was like really kind of almost foresty. There was a little bit of open sky, but it was not ideal. So mm-hmm. like just adding that little pop of light actually gives me proper lighting on my subject. So I don't have noisy images. Mm-hmm. Like that's not you're not pulling up and like trying to fix this light and dodging and burning. Like it can be just done in camera. Oh yeah. That's, that's huge. I mean, that's, I'm glad glad you brought that up because that's one of the great things about off camera flash is it can be done. I mean, minor tweaks, Yeah. but for the most part it's captured correctly. It looks beautiful and you don't have to spend time fixing things or, you Mm -hmm. know, I, I'm not a big fan of Photoshop. I think a lot of people know that I don't like to edit. I, I, it's not my thing. Right. I like to get it right in camera and off camera flash really allows me to do that. Yeah. So, and we don't, yeah. we don't make our money moving sliders. We make our money no. by producing a beautiful image at the end. Exactly. Exactly. And we can do that faster. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The um, other time that comes to mind that it's like, you know, there's no way I could have created this image without using some additional light is when I was in New Zealand and we were, you know, kind of scouting, but we had some models with us and we were shooting for ourselves a little bit before we started teaching um, before the workshop started. And we're up on this mountain and it's complete side light. So it's Mm -hmm. like three in the afternoon. So the sun is bright and it's coming from the side, but there's this whole mountain range in Mm -hmm. that direction. And I can't really move the mountains. Even (laughs) if I came back during golden hour, it's still going to be the wrong direction of light. So, Mm -hmm. oh, boom, enter just a little strobe there, balance the light on the dog. And it's like, oh, look at this beautiful, gorgeous image. 
that again needed very little Photoshop. I had to yeah. remove the light, so that was it. Because so that's it. It was fairly yeah. close to the dog. Um, no, it's it's but, incredible yeah. what it allows you to be able to do that you couldn't do with just natural light. And then yeah. another situation like photographing at sunset, where you want that beautiful, mm-hmm. you know, all the colors, the clouds, but there's not enough light. Like in that situation, obviously you're going to know there's a light on it, but mm-hmm. that's okay. That's the look you're getting. That's you know what you're getting into. I actually had a a shoot recently with two English cream retrievers at sunset and it, it turned out gorgeous. I mean, yeah. and because I had a light and I was able to balance and I got the, I mean, the sky was gorgeous. And yeah, I mean, you can't do that with natural light. Your dogs will be completely dark. Right. And right. yeah. So, but, uh, it's, it's definitely something that's, and it's the thing that I love about it. It's really not that difficult, you no. know, and it is the overwhelm with, Oh my gosh, what equipment do I use all these things? But when you really figure out the simple steps, like I, whenever I teach off camera flash, it's just very simple because I mean, I don't want to overwhelm anybody, let alone myself. So, and you can tweak it based on your, you know, just your style and everything like that. But I mean, there's pretty just a few simple steps and that's it. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah quick yeah. and easy. So speaking of that different equipment, I mean, we have kind of strobes and, you know, flashes and yeah. do you want to just talk real quick about when you might want to, you know, use each of those or what sure. people might want to to look for? Well, so there's a lot of different ways you can approach it. And, you know, you don't have to go out and buy, you know, thousands of dollars worth of equipment. You can start with, if you have a speed light, you can start with that. And I'll, you know, I started when I, when I first started getting into off-camera flash, I used my Nikon speed light. And you do have to get, I mean, I would recommend like a, a little, they're called rapid boxes. I think Westcott has one mm-hmm. and it just has to have the hot shoe mount and, you know, putting the, the key to off camera flash is obviously getting it off of the camera. So you have to, you know, have a separate light stand and, you know, there's little things, but you can start with something as basic as a speed light. And obviously, like I said, the rapid box and maybe a light stand, and you probably will need some sort of connection, either a pocket wizard to your camera or like a really long cable, um, depending on where you're going to put it. But Speed lights, I used to speed light for years and it created beautiful uh, images. The only issue that you come into is recycle times can be tricky um, Mm. in that you have to wait a lot longer versus if you were to use a strobe. But if you want to just start playing around with it, you know, you can easily, and you have a speed light, you can easily do that. I mean, there were times where I didn't even have a softbox. I literally took a paper towel and a rubber band and wrapped it around the top of it to diffuse the light. I mean, you got to figure out what works sometimes. It depends on where you are and what you, how much light you need. And a lot of times too, I'll say with the speed light is you may have to be on full power just because it doesn't have as much power as, as a strobe or something like that. Right. But the key with any off-camera flash system is you do want to use it in manual mode, be it your speed light or strobe or whatever, because you want to be able to control the light. You don't want it to do its automatic, you know, TTL or anything like that um, through the lens. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it would probably be pulling, it pulls, I'm, you know, not the most technical gear head, like, but it's when you're metering, if you're on TTL, say you're metering on a white dog, it's mm-hmm. picking the light based on that white. So it's going to not exposed properly because it doesn't know the dog's white. It's trying to probably expose for a gray. For gray. Like a neutral. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, typically TTL does not work for off-camera flash. You always right. want to be on manual, uh, but you want to have the control over the light anyways. But I, I mean, like I said, I used that speed light for several years until one time I was on a shoot and it overheated. It was in Houston. It's so hot here. <laughs> and I just was making it work too hard. And I had to put it in a cooler to have it, cool down and make small talk for like 20 minutes so that we could keep shooting. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and after that, I, I kicked that speed light to the curb and uh, moved on to a strobe. Um, and the nice thing about strobes is there's a wide variety of price ranges. Um, you don't have to, you know, go with something that's thousands of dollars, just something that has enough light. You don't need tons of light either. So I mm-hmm. went from the speed light to an alien B 400. And that was, I think it's like a 200 and $40 light, maybe. I mean, it's not ridiculously expensive. Of course, then there's things that come with it. Like, obviously, I wanted a diffuser, so I got the softbox. I had to get a uh, remote battery pack, their mini Vagabond, mm-hmm. a speed light. I actually use a cart to tote it around. It's easier. Um, and then, obviously, I have pocket wizards, which I would use in studio that I just took with me. So that whole setup was probably about $1,000, which right. is on the lower end, probably, if you wanted to go strobe. But I use that setup for years and beautiful, 
beautiful quality of light. Of course, you need to learn how to use your Alien B, but it, with any light system, you're going to have to learn how to use, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I went with the Alien B initially because it was much less expensive. Like I use Pro Photos in studio and mm-hmm. I love them. And I've since, I mean, this is years ago, I've since upgraded. I use a Pro Photo B10 now and it's awesome. Because yeah. the battery, the battery pack is built in. It's super small. It's easy to travel with. Um, beautiful light, obviously. Um, and now there are triggers that you can put on your camera that speak directly to the light, so you can adjust the light without having to get up and move it. I mean, there's so many options out there. Um, Godox is a is a one that a lot of people are getting. I honestly don't know a ton about Godox, but I know that the people I've talked to are really happy with them. They're cost, you know, good good price. Um, I think they're easy to use. I'm, I honestly yeah, can't I've heard speak the same. I, I don't have experience with them, but I know a lot of people have used them and really yeah. enjoy them. So yeah. yeah. So but but there's a lot of options and a lot of different price ranges. So you can find something that is works in your budget. Like you do not have to go out and buy a Pro Photo B10. Right. Right. Yeah. right. No. Like, I just want to play. I'll go buy this. Yes. <laughs> right. I'll just go buy this almost probably two thousand dollar light now. Uh, no, <laughs> not necessary. Beautiful light, love pro photo. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I have one. Yeah. Um, right, right. You know, I was, I was actually. You don't need off. to start there. Yeah. No, God, no, don't start there. Because I was on a shoot too. Always weigh down your lights too when you're outside. You never know. Using my pro photo B10 and umbrella, and a gust of wind comes, and boom, that thing hit the ground. Thank God it was fine. Yeah. But um, <laughs> you know, you you don't want your you know very expensive light to eat it. Hard. So, are you <laughs> shooting with your lights by yourself, or do you have an assistant? I never use an assistant. It's all me all the time. Uh, that's and, impressive. Well, I don't, you know, there, I think if you have an assistant, that's amazing. Oh my but, gosh. I know. Yeah. Cause then the voice activated light stands my favorite. <laughs> right. Right. I love that. <laughs> so when I first started out, oh my God, you're, God, it's been, yeah, like 11 years ago. I always loved lighting. And so I, you know, started with studio lights and natural light. And then I, I went quickly into off camera flash and my husband would meet me at the Arboretum in his suit at like five o'clock after work. And he would hold my light for my sessions. Aww. And I know, I know. But then it got to the point where um, he would go, man, that's a great image. Whoever held that light really knew what they were doing. I'm like, really? I told you where to stand. Like, seriously, I don't <laughs> need the chatter. But no, he was super helpful and awesome. And, um, but it got to the point where with off camera flash, like I mentioned earlier, you can photograph any time of day. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I didn't have kids when I opened my business and, so five o'clock at night or whenever was fine. But now, you know, three kids later, I'm not doing that. Uh, right. Sorry. And then, I just, yeah, somebody's got to watch the kids while you're off shooting. Yeah. So it's, yeah. No, <laughs> it's, it's insane. So I also don't like to have to manage other people's schedules. Mm-hmm. It's so much easier for me if I can just say, yeah, I'm available this time. Let's book it. Um, so that's one reason I just don't work with assistants. But yeah. I'm very transparent about how I work with my clients. So they know up front that if it's in studio, like they'll be assisting me if they're not going to be in the images yeah. or same thing on location. If they're not going to be in the images, even if they are, they're probably going to have to be wrangling the pet, but yeah. nobody's missing the light. It's literally on a cart weighted down and I just wheel it where I want it to go. That's so, perfect. Does it get yeah. low enough for the dogs? For a- it, it does. But yeah, you do sometimes run into that issue and there's a lot of different ways you can approach it. So I have a cart and I don't know if they sell it anymore. I got it from Blair Phillips. He's a photographer, but he's a people photographer. And um, I saw it at imaging one year and was like, oh my gosh, this is genius. And so it's like a a dolly and it has a light built in light stand, but I use the light stand. Like I'd never raise it because for dogs, I need it lower. But so I've seen people take a dolly and then take a monopod and attach it to the side so that it's even lower. So Mm. there's, People make they their own the, dollies. They have the too. little background stands too that uh, yes, are the background yes. light stands. They're only like a foot high. Oh, I know. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you don't have to use a cart. You don't have to use a dolly. But I mean, there are definitely ways to get the light lower. Like I have one of those background stands. You could easily use one of those um, mm-hmm. on location. But the cart is nice because I got a big uh, basket from Container Store that I attached on. So I put like my camera bag in there. I put water to the clients, bug spray, whatever I need to weight it down. Right. But then also it carries all my stuff, which is really nice. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, it's just, there's so many ways you can do it. And I've seen a lot of people just go to Home Depot, buy a dolly or like just like a little cart and just make their own, you know? Yeah. So I'm not, 
I'd rather, I'm horrible. I'd rather just buy it. <laughs> I know. I'm, just, I'm, not that, I'm not that handy. Neither is my husband. I'm just no. like, oh, I mean, the, the amount of time that it would take me yes. to go figure it out and the amount of things that I would buy that didn't work, I'd have to return. And I mean, if I'm switching out a light switch, I mean, it's probably at least two trips to Home Depot, if not three. So yeah, no, no, no. See, I, and I'm all about outsourcing and, you know, the cost, the, you know, time value of money and that uh-huh. it's probably more cost effective for me to just buy it and be done. Yeah. Right, I mean, I right. hate to say it, but we're not crafty like that. <laughs> I, I wish I were. I'm crafty in other ways, but not that way. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I love hearing you explain how you don't use an assistant because I think that is a mental block that a lot of people have. Sure. um, Before they're like, oh, I would love to start to use light, but I I shoot by myself. I always shoot by myself too, except Mm -hmm. I do if I know I'm going to have a session that's going to be using a lot of light, like, I don't know, a two o'clock in the Mm -hmm. afternoon session that I know my light's going to have to be used a lot. I will bring an assistant with me. And I usually just hire another local photographer. Yeah. Uh, And like, you know, I schedule it based on my schedule and I put it out in our local photographer group. I'm like, hey, who's available to assist me? And I just, you know, pay them uh, for the session, pay them for their time. And that works well for me too. Yeah. Cause I know, I mean, my husband's super helpful and, um, but I know the limits to our marriage, Kim, and I know me. (laughs) Oh, no, we're way past that. I can't ask Ted anymore. No, no. no. Yeah, and besides the fact that my kids are older now, but when they were little, yeah. like, someone's got to watch the kids, too. So, oh, I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, we're still back there, I feel like, because with, you know, he's home now, for the most part, just like he doesn't have to go back in the office yet. I'm like, okay, so I've got a call or I've got a shoot or whatever. And he's like, well, I have to work, too. I'm like, oh, God, and we're back. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like, I, I know we both have to work, but you know, finding someone and we have an eight month old. So it's like, oh, crap. Right. we have older kids that are self-sufficient. And then, oh, we have a baby again. So what was I thinking? <laughs> but no, yeah, it's fine that balance. So yeah, I don't even ask him. I would not. I mean, it's been years. Yeah. No, yeah. No. But if funny. in a pinch, if I have to have him help every once in a while, he's very good. He knows exactly what I want for handling and things like that. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's usually like on a family dog shoot or something. Right. You know? Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, let's jump back to our equipment. And mm-hmm. so we talked about speed lights or strobes. And mm-hmm. well, actually, let me ask you this, because on strobes, you have and I guess speed lights too, you can have the option for high speed sync. Mm-hmm. How important is that if you're going to be shooting outside? Honestly, I never use high speed sync. I yeah. think it, it really depends on your style and how you shoot. If you are trying to capture motion in full sun, then yeah, you're going to need some high speed sync. But for the purposes of capturing a nice portrait, um, it's really not that important. It's very important on picking your spot appropriately on where you're photographing because you don't want to, if you have the option to not be in full sun, obviously we don't want to be in full sun. We want to be in open shade, which Mm -hmm. will allow us a lot more flexibility. But I think, you know, starting out, I would not worry about high speed sync. I think that's just one more thing to confuse yourself with personally. But then, you know, if you're really interested and, and basically, so high speed sync, just in case people don't know, is it's where you can, you can shoot past your, your camera's sync speed, you know, where, where you can have higher shutter speeds, basically. So, so it really depends, like if you're, like I said, capturing motion or um, just shooting at a time of day that you really need to have a faster shutter speed. But like I said, I, I don't think I've ever used it, honestly, yeah. when using off camera flash, but it's not also my style, really. I don't really ever do capture motion, like treat throwing or, or if I do action shots, I use natural light. It's too difficult to try to place your light in the Mm -hmm. appropriate place and get it to flash at the appropriate time. If you're trying to capture a a dog running, it just, it's just very difficult. (laughs) Right. Right. Especially without that voice activated uh, light. Oh yeah. No. So (laughs) I I just don't even, yeah, bother, but, um, but it's something to be aware of and to know of, uh, that's out there. Um, Yeah. you know, so the high speed sync um, range for most cameras is usually one two hundredth or one two fiftieth of a second somewhere in that mm-hmm. range, and each camera might be a little different. I actually use my high s- speed sync. I'd say probably half the time. Yeah, because I like to still shoot with a really shallow depth of field. <laughs> well, and that's another thing too. It yeah. depends, like I said, your style and how you mm-hmm. shoot for sure. So I don't shoot very wide open. Uh, yeah. Typically, I'm at like five, six, or eight. And that seems, you know, because yeah. people will be like, well, but what about the depth of field? And, and uh, you know, I still get beautiful depth of field. It's just making sure that my subject is far enough from the background. 
Um, right. There's all these little things to consider. And I like to shoot at that, you know, that uh, aperture because I want to get, make sure that my dogs are completely in focus. If I have multiple dogs, I want to make right. sure that they're both in focus by people, you know, on and on and on. But that's also my style. So it, it is going to be, so for your style, I mean, high speed sync makes sense. Yeah. For mine, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which you mm-hmm. can also, if you don't have high speed sync, if you're like looking at your stuff, you're like, man, shoot, I should have bought one with high speed sync. Mm-hmm. And you don't, you can grab a neutral density filter and that will just yep. lessen the light going into your camera. So you can keep uh, your settings at a little bit more, mm-hmm. more where you want them. So there's always so many different options out there with that. Oh gosh. Yes. I mean, uh, I actually was playing yeah. around recently with off camera flash, um, kind of a bright day and I have a graduated filter. Yeah. And it's just a 50 50. And so I put, because we were still having issues with getting the background, uh, it was so bright, getting it down enough without making, even with off camera flash, getting the dog uh-huh. bright enough. And with the graduated filter, it made all the difference. Oh, nice. I don't know. You just had it darker on the sky. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. then the, but then you run into the issue if you start adjusting your camera to do portrait or landscape. It's like, oh, wait, let me adjust the filter. <laughs> right, yeah. So right. it's not ideal. It was just kind of more of a seeing what would happen. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's talk modifiers because mm-hmm. that's, you know, once you start to narrow down the equipment, then we have all these modifiers. So, hey, a whole jungle of modifiers oh, out yeah. there. Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> what uh, what are your, some of your favorites? So with mine, oh, let me start from the beginning. Let's see. When I used a speed light, I used a rapid box, which was great. And it's just like, a, like 12 by 12 ish kind it, of. I think, they, I think they come now like two by two feet. Oh, okay. A little yeah. bit bigger. Yeah. Um, and then. When I went to the Alien B, I used a three by four softbox, which is oh, pretty wow. big. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I don't necessarily recommend that. I just, I don't know why I went with that. And now I use um, with the B10, I use the um, uh, beauty dish, the collapsible beauty dish, which is I think is mm-hmm. two feet wide, and I have to do the silver interior because of the, trying to pick up the specular highlights in the pet's fur. But if I have a large group, I'll use an umbrella. It just mm. depends. Um, What's this umbrella? Typically, I will use. A uh, smaller, a medium, and I just have these Profoto umbrellas that came with my D1 Air lighting yeah. kit that I bought 10 years ago. <laughs> um, but you, yeah, because you don't want to, the light's not huge, so you don't want to use a modifier that's too big because it will right. weigh it down. But I don't use the umbrella a ton. It's only, like I said, if I have a pretty decent sized group and then I, you know, modify where I actually position the light so I make sure everybody gets enough light, you know, getting technical about that. But let's say if I have two dogs, typically I use. The um the classical beauty dish on the B10 and that's it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and if yeah. you have a group and you're using that umbrella, are you shooting into the umbrella that then's bouncing back to the dogs, or are you having like the top of the umbrella facing the dog shooting into the umbrella that goes through to the dogs? No, I, I bounce it out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But there are some that have the diffusing panel on the front, which I actually just got a deep silver umbrella from Profoto where I put the diffuser. So it's like a big softbox basically. Mm -hmm. And so that one I I really like a lot, but it's still bouncing for the back and it's just got a diffusion panel. So. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So many things. Yeah. I find, um, I love that collapsible beauty dish from Profoto too. I use that a lot because mm, it's, it's so easy to travel with. I have a hard shell one. I do too, but that's, but it's so much heavier yeah, it's, too. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, the collapsible one's so easy and so light. And then I have a, uh, gosh, what is it? It's a 30 inches, like an mm-hmm. Octobox. I think it's like 30 inches. Yeah, I've... The sucker is big. You don't think, you don't think going from like the 22 inch or whatever collapsible to like another eight oh, inches. Big. Yeah. But, uh, Oh no, that's yeah, large. Yeah. And it, I mean, <laughs> do you, the, the key to remember too, is like, do you need that big of a modifier? Probably not. Because right. really we're, we're adding a little bit of light to what's already there. So you don't have to go crazy, you know? And mm-hmm. so, yeah, yeah, like my three by four softbox was definitely too big. I don't know. I think I got that just because I was like, oh, I'll just do the studio outside kind of thing. But you know. yeah. Well, and you always hear, you know, bigger light is softer right. light. And so you're like, oh, you know, but yeah, yeah there comes a size, yeah. <laughs> a size management I mean, issue. it's definitely <laughs> like traveling with all of the Alien B stuff, definitely way more stuff. And with the Profoto, I can throw it all in one bag. And it's, I can yeah. fly with it. I can um, easily put it, you know, take it anywhere. It's so nice for travel and compact. So nice. Yeah. Nice. I love it. I love it. All right. So we've talked about the different kinds of flash. We've talked about the mm-hmm. modifiers. Let's talk about just kind of getting started of that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I do want to get out there and practice. 
Do you have advice for people that just, you know, just to help them get started playing around with this? Sure. So let's see where to start. I mean, (laughs) if you've got to speed light, just start there. Like, I don't want people to feel that they need to go invest in a ton of equipment up front. You can also rent equipment. Mm. There's a lot of places Mm -hmm. just just to test. But so one of the biggest things when you're using off camera flash that I like to tell people is don't go look for the best background, look for the best light. Because this is, I mean, with any, even natural light shooting, because it all starts there, figuring out, once you figure out your spot and where you're going to photograph, and this is where scouting comes into play, um, you want an area that's obviously, if you can help it, not in full shade, not with a ton of dappled light, hopefully open shade, where the background is not ridiculously bright. Because what we're trying to do is balance the ambient light with the flash. We don't want it to look flashy. And so if you pick an area that is, super contrasty. If it has like ridiculous amount of bright light behind it, but it's in shade, it's going to be really hard to balance that light. So start by giving yourself a break and picking a place that's kind of, you know, doesn't have that giant contrast, but it's just a really a few simple steps. So first of all, you know, we pick our spot. um, And then what I do first is I meter for the background. And because we want to make sure, obviously, that the background, whether it's the sky or just maybe it's just a slightly brighter background or whatever it is, we want to make sure that that's exposed properly. We don't want it to be blown out. We want details in our highlights and our shadows. And so I always, I I basically, what I do is I take a single point focus and I focus on an area of the background and I meter in camera. I mean, it's not like Mm -hmm. rocket science. Like, (laughs) I don't, I don't, I'll pull out a light meter and all this (laughs) stuff now. So, um, and I meter in camera. And also, we typically, you know, you mentioned noise earlier. We don't want to have our ISO up at like, you know, a thousand or whatever. I typically, when I shoot off camera flash, keep it within uh, 100 to 400 range. So I always start at 100. And, you know, so if I meter for my background, whatever that may be, typically, just based on my style, I like to keep my uh, shutter speed around 1 125th of a second. And my aperture is usually about five, six, or eight. Of course, it depends on the lighting situation. But so let's say, so I meter for my background. And then based on the way I like to shoot it, I take my aperture and I drop it down an additional stop to make it a little darker because I want my subject to really pop. Mm -hmm. And then I put my subject in there and I start adjusting the light. And this is where it's not, it's not really like, and you adjust it to this amount. No, this is where... you have to play around with it. Mm-hmm. And I do have to play around with it every time I set it up. Yep. And so you set it up and I always start kind of like every light is different, but I'll start at like a quarter power. Yeah. And I'll, and the key is not to don't get your subject in place and start like trying to make expressions or get, no, we're testing the light. And I'm walking my client through this whole thing saying, okay, so we're going to photograph here. Let's put your dog right here. I'm just going to test the light first. Cause I don't want to waste no. great expressions right. if the light's not right. Yeah. So I'll test quarter power, check back of my camera. Okay, no, I need more. Then I'll bump it up to a half power, test again. If it's good to go, we'll start shooting. If it's not, I keep testing. And I do this very quickly, yeah, obviously. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. But then when you get the light right, then you can shoot. But every time you move, you're probably going to have to look at it again. <laughs> but it's really, but once you get comfortable with it, just making sure you meter for your background. I drop it down, my aperture down a stop. You do not have to do that. That's just a personal preference because I like my images a little darker to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, they still have detail. I just like them a little... You know, I mean, you've seen my studio stuff. It's very mid to low key. It's yeah. just how I like it. And um, and then I add in the light. And so the one thing you have to remember though, when, when it starts to look flashy, it's probably because you're not letting in enough ambient light mm-hmm. and your shutter speed is what controls that. So by keeping my shutter speed about 125th of a second, It allows me to let in enough ambient light. The closer you get to 200, 250, the darker it's going to get all over because there's not enough light coming through. So if you find that it's looking really flashy, there's there's several things you can do. And I like how you mentioned earlier learning your manual camera because understanding how your ISO, your aperture, and your shutter speed work together is really important for understanding off-camera flash. Mm -hmm. Because you have to understand, okay, if it's looking flashy, it's too dark all over, I probably need to have a slower shutter speed. Because I need to let in more ambient. Or if it's looking, if I, you know, if if I need more light on my subject, well, I can either adjust my aperture, I can adjust the power on the light, I can physically move the light closer or further away, 
And if I need just more light overall, well, then maybe I need to adjust my ISO. So there's all these things that you have to understand so that when you're actually working with off-camera flash, you're not sitting there going, okay, what controls right, what? Right. Especially if you're in front of a client. Yeah. So the whole process, I mean, it took me a while to explain, but at the same time, like if I'm out there, I can do this really quick, but mm-hmm. I've done it. I mean, I can say how many times. So understanding, test all your stuff before you go out there and make sure everything's fully yeah. charged. That's the worst. <laughs> yes. um, make sure your light's actually firing. I will never forget. I was at a... A tough shoot, and I've shot all these uh, images, and I looked down. I'm like, "Oh, I forgot to turn the light on." Awesome, you know. I mean, we still make these mistakes, even though we've been doing it for forever, and it's just, you know, frustrating. You make sure everything's, or sometimes with the speed light, the little connector mm-hmm. board, at least mine, always popped out, always. So, um, you know, but but really, I mean, those are very there's three steps that I do. Yeah, you know, and, and very simple, but it but it's. Practice. I mean, you have to practice. Yeah. Because I, when I first started with off-camera flash to what it looks like now, or do two different things. <laughs> That's but with anything that happens for all of us, right? And even when we yeah. start shooting, we're like, oh. And you know, you think when you're starting, you're like, oh man, this is my best picture ever. This is awesome. And then you look at it <laughs> right? ten years later, you're like, oh my god, someone paid me for that. I feel like I should go give them oh. their money back. <laughs> right? No, I mean, I feel the same for some studio work. There's one client that's come to me every year since I've been open, and the stuff I gave them in the beginning, I'm like, I'm sorry, I won't say that to them, but I'm like, it's embarrassing. Right? 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 Yeah, it mm-hmm. just takes practice, and you guys really. <laughs> Truly, I do it the same way. Just break it down of three steps. Expose for your background, add light, adjust light. Done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, that's it. That's, that's it. literally it. <laughs> I mean, it's so simple. And I think the key, though, that a lot of people get hung up on is the equipment. Right. The equipment can feel daunting, but it's really a matter of picking a light source, learning how to use that light source, and getting comfortable with mm-hmm. it. And I've worked with, obviously, I mean, speed light, different strobes over the years. But the, like when I teach workshops and we talk about studio lighting, they're like, well, how does the light work? Well, they all work in the same in that they have power from zero to full power. But the buttons might be slightly different. Whatever light you get, you just need to familiarize yourself with it. Mm-hmm. Same with the camera. Like when I got the Sony, I read the manual <laughs> because I didn't know how to use it. It's the same thing. Take the time to understand your equipment. And if you understand how to operate your equipment and you follow those three simple steps, it's really not that hard. Yeah. I love but it. Practice. I love it. I mean, just practice. Yeah. And it will literally be the light will go off above your brain. You're like, oh my gosh, how did I ever think this was hard? <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. Now it's like off camera flash. Uh, yeah. And, and once you understand it and once you see what it can do for that, your flexibility, what your, your end result of your work looks like, your editing time. I, I don't know why you'd ever go back to just being a natural light photographer. Right. I mean, I still use natural light. Don't get me wrong. If it's if it's beautiful, I'm I'm I don't need the light. Yeah, right, right. But but also I can't just hope and pray and fingers crossed that it's gonna look good. Yeah. So that's why I always have that option available. Exactly. Yeah. Well, if any of you guys are out there listening and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this sounds really fun. I do want to get out there and practice and I want to learn more, but oh man, I'd love some feedback and some help with that. Oh. Kim can help you out because in the hair of the dog, we are having our Academy Accelerators, which is open for Academy members and also our community members. Academy members um, save $100 though, because you guys are special. Um, But um, (laughs) yeah, and it's open for anyone in the community. And uh, Kim is teaching one on gaining confidence with off-camera flash. So Kim, do you want to tell us about your accelerator real quick? Sure. So um, I'm super excited about this one because we did an accelerator. I don't even remember what month, March. but on Studio Light. Yeah. yeah, in March. And it was so fun. And we, uh, I had great students. And they were really excited to learn. And we really helped with Studio Lighting. And they were all kind of asked for the off-camera flash. It's kind of a, a, set, a 2.0 is what they were saying. So um, because really, like I said, off-camera flash, it's, it's not that difficult, but it's gaining that confidence. And that's what I'm going to help you do in that accelerator by going over more in depth, the different types of equipment, the um, what you need to get started. we we'll actually have assignments where you actually go out and photograph things with off camera flash, where we do critiques to help you understand where we can improve, where we can make our images stronger, how we need to make adjustments and go over all these, you know, all the steps that we've talked about, but obviously in more depth, just to help you, like I said, the, what it's called, gain confidence with off-camera flash. And I'm there to help you the whole, you know, through the whole thing. And it's, it's you know, I was really 
pleasantly surprised with how it went with the studio lighting accelerator. Cause I was kind of like, I don't know how it's going to translate because it's via zoom and Facebook group, but actually it's, it was great. And, um, I feel like everybody left feeling really a lot more uh, confident about their studio work, which is exactly what's going to happen with off camera flash. Yeah. So excited. So, um, Kim's st- class starts September 7th and it's four Tuesdays in a row. And, um, there's replays if you can't make the call live and you can still submit your, your images for her to critique and it'll be so fun. And applications are actually open now. If you guys want to jump in, they're small groups. So we're limited to 20 students only per accelerator. So it's a small group. So everyone can get the feedback that they're looking for and, you know, and just get that support. Mm-hmm. And if you go to hair of the dog academy.com slash accelerator, uh, you will find that. And we have, yeah, Kim's is the off camera flash. Mark Moffat from dirty dog photography. She's also one of our elevate coaches is doing an accelerator on inquiries, getting your inquiry process like dialed in. It's so good. She did this with our elevate students earlier in the year and, They loved it. And then um, Heather Lawton is doing one in October about um, being more visible in your marketing. So those are all open now. If you go to hairofthedogacademy.com slash accelerator, you can see the details. You can jump in uh, and they're all limited to 20. So go grab your spot now. And if you guys are an Academy member, just check uh, the Academy portal for your special Academy member discount code. But um, yeah, we'd love to see you in there. And Kim, I'm so excited to see Mm -hmm. the work that everyone in your accelerator is going to produce. Yeah, you had some awesome students in the studio one. So fun. Yeah, and everybody was so involved, which was great. I mean, and people were posting stuff that they did outside of the assignments in the Facebook group. And it was just, it was really fun to see. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, thanks so much for being here with us today to talk about off-camera flash, to get people hopefully inspired to get out there and just play with the equipment that you have. And if you don't have any, you can rent some, you know, you can get started with a speed light for a couple Mm -hmm. hundred dollars for a speed light, a little rapid box and, um, you know, something to connect them. It it doesn't have to cost a fortune. And, um, yeah, we would love to see what you guys are creating. And uh, thanks again so much, Kim, for being here with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun as usual. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Talk to you guys next week. If you enjoy this podcast episode, go ahead and take a screenshot of this episode on your phone and post it up there on your Instagram stories. And be sure to tag us at Hair of the Dog Academy. And we would just love to see how you're listening. And uh, full disclosure... Sometimes we just like to give away a little pet photographer swag in the form of hair of the dog, t-shirts and sweatshirts. So what are you waiting for? Go ahead and share that screenshot of this episode. And don't forget to tag us at hair of the dog Academy. And while you're there, maybe you want to jump on over to our account and see what we're up to on the gram. Would love to connect with you. Thanks for listening to the Hair of the Dog podcast. If you want to check out the show notes for access to any of the links that we shared in this episode, as well as any additional related resources, simply go to www.hairofthedogacademy.com slash 97. Once again, that's www.hairofthedogacademy.com slash the numbers nine and seven. Thanks for listening to this episode of Hair of the Dog podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please take a minute to leave a review. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our upcoming episodes. One last thing. If you are ready to dive into more resources, head over to our website at www.hairofthedogacademy.com. Thanks for being a part of this pet photography community.